quiet those voices and those racing thoughts. And we trust that God has all the time in the world, and so he just waits for us. Just a deep breath. So, Lord God, uh, we come to you tonight, as always, with hearts that are filled with gratitude. Lord, that's the place we want to come from. We ask you for the grace of open hearts. We ask you for the grace to keep us uh, focused and tuned in tonight, to drown out, to quiet any distractions that might threaten to steal our attention. And we just pray for an openness, open minds and open hearts tonight. We pray for the renewal of our minds, that as we take in this information, that it, it becomes something more than information, that it leads to transformation in our own hearts. And so I ask God for the grace tonight for each of us that we would surrender. Surrender whatever part of ourselves, whatever part of our past, whatever part of our present needs to be surrendered to you, Lord, and only you know that. We just give that over to you right now. Or we try to. We pray for the desire to do that. We give you our vocation, Lord. Whether we are married and parents, whether we're currently single, whether we are celibate, clergy, whatever our vocation is, Lord, we recognize that you have, that's what you've called us to right now. And we surrender that to you as well. And lastly, Lord, I want to pray that you would speak uh, through me, through Father Michael, through Margaret, through those of us who will share tonight. And that any, any gaps that might be present, any way that we might misspeak, Lord, that you would just sweep in and heal wounds and fill gaps, and that, that you would speak through us, that you would just speak truth, speak your truth to us this evening. And we ask all this in your holy and mighty name. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. All right, so just very briefly, um, if you didn't get a handout last week, we, I have some extras, our printed extras that are on that, ta that check-in table out there, so we can get you one or feel free to get one. But just to recap last week, remember that Father Michael talked a lot about the garden. We went back to Genesis, and so remember we really emphasized last week the importance of us being immer immersed in and familiar with those first three chapters of Genesis. Remember we said we can't really answer any questions about who we are or where we're going unless we know where we came from. And so all the answers to all of our questions begin in the garden. They begin with the understanding the creation story and those questions of um, why, how God made us, why God made us, and then better understanding the fall. And Father Michael will talk some more about that um, this evening. Um, so yeah, just, just, a, just a reminder that we were... Um, we were created in God's image, man and woman, he created us, and that matters, that matters. And I say that matters only because I think we can't say enough, I need this reminder over and over again, that a lot of us, maybe all of us, we've heard this before, you've probably heard this before. If you haven't heard it before, that's great, because now you're hearing it for the first time, and you're hearing it the right way, and maybe hopefully receiving it the right way. But I would just say, um, that, that really, if you've heard this before and, and you've heard the creation stories, and maybe it, maybe it doesn't sound like new or different, this is an opportunity, of, uh, opportunity for us to like really engage our imagination in a good way, the imagination that God gave us, to really like dig, to dig deeper and, and to think about these things or to allow ourselves to consider these, these Bible stories. Maybe that's all they've ever been to you were Bible stories. That's what they were for me for a long time, not necessarily... Um, like the origins of my human existence. And so just an encouragement to really dig deep and allow yourself to hear this stuff in new ways and to engage with it in new ways. Um, I, think that's, I think that's an important part of our, our disposition as we try to receive this and hear it in a new way. So, yeah, that's mainly the, uh, there was so much more that Father Michael said, but I, I won't dwell on it because there's more to say tonight. We are obviously covering a lot of ground in a short amount of time. Again, this is an overview of the theology of the body, and I know we keep pumping resources at you, and um, I don't want anybody to get overwhelmed. You just do your best, and we'll just take this uh, one bite at a time, and we'll, we'll continue to support each other. So with that, I'm going to invite Margaret Rogers to come on up. So, Margaret, if you'll join me up here, I'm going to pray a brief prayer over you. Um, I asked Margaret to share a little bit. You move this. You probably move this. So you move this stand. 
Okay. So I asked Margaret um, if she, I'm going to give that to you for a minute, if she would share a bit about the season of life that she and her husband Ryan, and so uh, Margaret, it, you know, there we could, I could probably go on, but Margaret is a revert to the Catholic faith. That's a beautiful story in and of itself, but um, just a wonderful friend and role model to me and to so many in our parish. And then her husband Ryan, same thing. They were on this this conversion journey, reversion journey, back to the Catholic Church together. Um, she, a plug for her blog. She has an amazing blog that she's where she writes out that story. So if you want to hear the details of that story, I'll let Margaret direct you to her blog. And then her both both Margaret and Ryan have a background in mental health. Ryan does counseling here at our parish, and so he was unable to be here tonight. So Margaret's kind of speaking on behalf of both of them. Um, and then maybe Ryan will join us one night in the future when we when we do this again. But I asked Margaret to come. I, I kind of alluded to this last week when I said that um, I quoted Margaret as saying that at this stage of their parenting with their age children, they're in that kind of shield and protect stage where they're focusing a lot on the circle of influence around their children. And so I just asked her if she would come and share a little bit more about that with us. And so I, I just want to say that when we invite people like Margaret up here, or even when I shared, you know, my own story of what Vince and I, our, our approach to parenting, um, of course, we're not, none of us are standing up here with the assumption that we're getting it all right, or that we're doing it perfectly. I just want to make sure we all know that we're not, that, you know, we, we're just trying. This is all of us fumbling through, and I, I just find it, and I think most of you would agree, I find it helpful to have a little bit of a window into how other families do it, and how other couples are approaching this. Um, I always, I just always gain insights when I learn how other people are doing it. So that's what, that's why we're highlighting Margaret and Ryan, um, so that we can just have a little bit of an insight into um, this particular season and stage of parenting. All right. So if you would, um, I'm going to just pray over Margaret. If you want to extend your hands towards her, you're welcome to. We'll just pray a quick prayer. Come Holy Spirit. Come Lord Jesus. Lord God, I ask you to please rain down your might and your mercy and your wisdom on our sister Margaret as she shares with us from her heart, from her maternal heart, her heart as a wife and as a mother. I thank you, God, for the gifts that you have placed in her life, for the vocation that you've called her to, and I thank you for the gift that she is to all of us and to our parish. And so I just pray that your Holy Spirit would reside with her, would speak through her um, as she shares your heart with all of us. And let's pray, let's go ahead and just pray uh, for the intercession of our Blessed Mother. Let's pray Hail Mary. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hello, so I'm Margaret Rogers. Um, yes, I like, this is not to highlight me or my family or anything like that. There's just some things that I know we all try and do as parents to raise our children in the faith. And so really that's what I wanted to talk about. Just a couple of those things for our life phase right now. So our oldest is six. So clearly this is amateur hour, right? I don't know anything about parenting preteens or teenagers. You know, that's just a total, total blind spot for me. And so what I want to talk about, though, is that there are things that my husband Ryan and I are trying to do to hopefully lay a groundwork so that our children can, can be ready and able to follow Christ into these, in these future life stages. So but I do just want to clarify, our house is insane. It's a mess right now. Like, my bed's covered in laundry, you know. Um, our children are loud. Our lives are crazy. And so please don't, I'm not standing up here to say, everyone, look at, look at us and do what we do necessarily. And so there's not like Gregorian chant music playing in, in, our, in our house and our children aren't running up to us like, Mom, one more rosary, please. You know, that's just not, it's not what it's like. So I just want to really clarify, come by any time. Like, you'll hear where we live just by how loud our home is. And so, and I also want to highlight, too, it, like how this is just a continual journey. Today, as I'm thinking about this talk, I walk out into our family room and our front door is wide open, just wide open. And I'm like, which child ran out? to the front door. That's not allowed. Well, it's Naomi, my three and a half year old, and she's just standing on our front lawn, only in her underwear, just, just looking around. And I'm running after her, like, theology of the body, like, let's, let's bring her inside, you know. Your, your body is private and special, like, she, like, all these things we're constantly talking about, which I'm talking about tonight, so just know, like, great, like, check the fail mark just earlier today. So, um, one thing that um, really sets the stage for us is just this quote I heard one time, that our homes are the nursery of Christianity, and so 
our perspective and just the framework with which we approach this, this idea of the theology of the body with our children or even just how we instill the gospel in our children just comes back to this idea that in our vocation of marriage and in, in having children, that it's, it's us. Like, we are the authority in our children's lives. You know, the buck really does stop with us parents. We are ultimately responsible before God for how we raise our children. And so I just want to quick, quick note that, you know, this, this is truly, like, through the grace and mercy of God, but it's truly on us as parents. And it's a weighty task, and it's terrifying pretty much daily trying to form these souls, and we're setting aside a good, healthy counseling budget for their future. Even though we are counselors, we're just, you know, messing up all the time. But so essentially that in our vocation, that this is truly our job. So no matter how wonderful our priests are, no matter how wonderful our youth leaders are, that essentially, you know, we as the parents, it, it, we are responsible for forming our children. And so for Ryan and I, that's something that, you know, we approach this whole concept through this lens. And so I'm going to be talking about small children, but again, I think it's applicable to any child, no matter their age, because essentially it's just laying the groundwork of the gospel, laying the groundwork of what our bodies are for and why, and why we are here. And so I'm trying to be very, um, very applicable in how and explaining how we do this in our own family. So in this, in this life phase I'm talking about, I'm, I'm kind of going to term it, you know, shield and protect or defend and define is sort of, you know, the, the, the title for it. Because essentially we are trying to shield our children from maybe some of the, the um, bad influences in the world, the true evil, whether it's from sexual predators. Um, my counseling, uh, my background in mental health counseling, I worked for a couple of years counseling children, um, child survivors of child sexual abuse. And so, um, so that's sort of the, the lens I look at this question as well in the theology of the body. So at the end, I'm going to talk about just a couple of really applicable, very practical ways that we can just protect our children um, from predators who are out there. And so I'll, end, I'll talk about that as well. But so really the main thing is that Ryan and I, we know our identity is just in the gospel of Christ, that we were saved by Jesus through the free gift of grace, through no merit of our own, that we are children of God, and that um, Ryan and I, are we live our lives and we view the world through the gospel. And so that is essentially the root and groundwork of our own parenting, is that we hopefully are trying to just proclaim the gospel and teach the gospel to our children every single day. That as we fumble and fall as disciples of Christ, that we are constantly trying to talk to our children and talk about our own sin and our own failing and losing our patience or whatever it might be, our need for the sacraments and for grace and for confession. And so essentially we want to saturate our children in the gospel. So that's basically part one. And so um, essentially we're trying to teach our children who they are, that they're the beloved children of God, why they're here, and then also what their bodies are for. And one way that we do that in our family is that we talk about the gospel and we also really try and focus on sort of the invisible world the, the real invisible world that is surrounding all of us all the time. So we teach our children about the good angels and how there are bad angels and how there's this epic battle for their souls and that, and that Jesus has fought and died and spilled his blood on our behalf to save us from our sin, but that we are participating in this battle to try and go out and save other people, and that's the point of our lives. And, so, and that we're really trying to root our children in this idea um, that they're, this, they're just— participating in this awesome adventure of discipleship and, and awesome adventure of Christianity. So that's sort of like the groundwork. Okay, so how do we do that? So every day we try and pray over our children. We try and proclaim the gospel in prayer over our children. So whether we are praying in the car because we aren't home or whether we're praying in our family room or in the drive through or at dinner, just however it looks, whatever, however busy the day might get or if Ryan's here doing ministry and it's just me doing bedtime, I try and just spend time praying over each of my children. And I have to say, I think one of the most amazing parts of this whole series so far, apart from all the awesomeness Father Michael has taught us, but then Teresa's, Teresa's point of, of incorporating into their prayer, Jesus, thank you for making their daughter a girl or for their, making their son a boy. And so we've actually added that over the last two weeks in our own family prayer. But so this is what it sounds like. So if I'm praying over Isaac, my six-year-old, this is how it goes. Jesus, thank you so much for creating Isaac. God, thank you that you've made him so good, that you have formed him, that you have fashioned him, that you've given him to us as a gift in our family. Jesus, thank you for making Isaac such a wonderful gift. Thank you for making Isaac a boy. Thank you that you love Isaac so much that you died to save him, that you um, have rescued him from sin, and please help Isaac to know you and love you and follow you all of his days. So, just on repeat, we're just constantly trying to just rehearse the gospel so our children can understand who they are 
in light of not just their everyday world and their family, but in light of this eternal perspective and this eternal battle and this eternal adventure going on that they're a part of through Christ. And we also try and make the gospel personal for our children so that Christ wants a relationship with them, that Christ wants a friendship with them, a daily intimacy with them. And so we encourage them to pray on their own. When, when we, I'm shutting the door at night, I'm reminding them, okay, now it's your time to talk to Jesus. He wants to hear from you. You can tell him whatever you want. He is your friend, and he wants to, to be part of your life, and he wants to be you know, at the center of your life. And so just trying to essentially lay this groundwork for these bigger and, and you know, increasingly important concepts, especially when it comes to the big decisions our kids will be making as they get older. And so one, since I am not a trained theologian and I don't know much and I heavily rely on resources that are out there, I just brought this with me as one example. So this is a book that just teaches our children the gospel, and it also has the old school Baltimore Catechism questions and answers that our kids can just memorize because we just have them memorize who they are. So who made you? My little three-year-old, God made me, you know, then she gets an M&M &M or something. Like, we usually have some sort of reward, and this is what we do at breakfast. We just kind of review these things so that they can memorize it. So the idea is that it kind of is saturated into their hearts and their brains so that as they get older and as they get bigger, that it's just part of the fabric of their very being, that they know who they are, they know their purpose in life, they know why they were created, and they can go out and hopefully, you know, evangelize the world and change the world for Christ. And so... Um, essentially, we're laying this groundwork of the gospel because we're calling our kids forth to this life of heroic virtue. So I totally was um, resonating with what Teresa was saying earlier. In my own life growing up, you know, just kind of the, the not-to-do not list was very prominent in youth group and at church, and so here are all the things to not do, but I agree with Teresa that I really needed to sort of know and have an intimacy with the virtue. So what am I chasing after? What am I pursuing? Um, not just where's the line and how close can I get to it, which was probably the mantra of way too long of my, especially young adulthood, but, but if I had known, I think about these virtues, and so that's another thing we're trying to, to instill in our own children is this idea of temperance and self-mastery and self-control so that as they get older, and especially as they're coming up to maybe questions about what, how they use their body or sexual intimacy or, you know, all these bigger choices as they get older that hopefully they're rooted in these ideas of, of self-mastery and self-control. And so one way we do that is there are all these wonderful, again, these are kind of old school, but children's books, like the child's first steps to virtues or the Aesop's fables or the fairy tales that just kind of highlight good and evil, right? Delayed gratification and the people who are impatient and selfish and usually, you know, if something terrible happens to them, which is great. And so, so we try and rely on um, basically saturating our children with these stories, right? And so, and the main way when it comes to these lives of heroic virtue, which we're trying to call forth in our children, is trying to inundate them with the lives of the saints. So mommy and daddy are major bummer failures most of the time when it comes to parenting our children. We highlight our own impatience and anger and lack of self-control, but Praise God, Jesus is perfect, and Jesus always forgives us. And praise God, we have these amazing examples of saints who are also sinners, but who through their own, you know, through the grace of Christ and their own choice of courage and virtue, that they chose to live this epic life for Jesus. And that's what our children are called to, and that's what we are called to. So every night for the last several weeks, I found the 60 saints for boys. They are awesome, and they're for boys, because there's dragons, there's murder, there's, you know, some epic courage, some quest, something to go on. It was awesome. This was last night. We read Isaac Picks. We read about St. Cyril, one of the St. Cyrils. And we read it. It's about a young boy. His parents are pagans, but he becomes Christian. And then the governor of his town finds out, and his parents, like, kick him out of the house. And essentially, Cyril just gets thrown into a big fire, bonfire, and dies. And my children are very sensitive, but the way it's worded and the way it's told, it's not scary. And so essentially it's like he dies and then he's before the throne of God and God's like, good job, you know, etc. We finish the story, I'm tucking in Isaac, and then he goes, Mom, I just don't think God's calling me to be a martyr. And I was like, oh. <laughs> I mean, I was like, oh, okay, why do, I mean, why do you say that? And we don't know, I mean, maybe, why, you know, why do you say that? And he said, well, because you don't mind that I'm a Christian, right? Like, it's just this whole <laughs> concept of... <laughs> If your parents are pagan, you're probably going to get thrown into a bonfire. But my parents love Jesus, so I'm good. They're like, no, son, you'll be a martyr praying for that. No, I'm just kidding. So um, anyway, so back to this defend and define idea. So this is like the groundwork. This is sort of the, the soil we're hoping to cultivate in our children so they can go forth and hopefully do wonderful things for the kingdom. 
And so, so then how do we talk about our kids, their bodies? So like truly, when it comes to just forming our children and their understanding of who they are and then what their bodies are for, our step one is just the crucifix. I mean, this is what our bodies are for. Christ goes before us and we are called to also lay down our bodies in whatever the vocation God is calling us to, whether it's to the priesthood or religious life or to the vocation of fatherhood or motherhood or whatever it might be, that our bodies are here to serve others, to glorify God, and then to one day, you know, have a resurrected body and be happy in heaven with Jesus forever. And so this idea of like defending and then defining. So we try really hard to just define everything when it comes to our children's bodies for them. And we're trying to teach them this. And the thing that really formed Ryan and I is when our oldest was two, we encountered this talk by Christopher West. I think it's called like Beyond the Talk or something like that. We had it on CD, but it's also on YouTube. It's on the internet. And so Christopher West talks about the first time his oldest son just asked him a question about his body. And this is Christopher West, who, you know, is now like this theology of the body person. He runs these courses that um, a bunch of our people here have taken. And, but he talks about that first time and that first moment and that first sort of, you know, <gasps> gasp and the first moment of like, am I going to just ruin this child forever? You know, what's going to happen? And he talks about how his kid's in the bathtub and he's just looking down at his private area and he's just saying, Dad, what is this? And so Christopher West has this moment, and then he just goes, son, that is your penis, and it is awesome. And that's just, for Ryan and I, so that's the mode and the mentality we've had with our own children, you know? Son, that is your whatever, and it is awesome, and it is a gift from God, and it's private and special. And so we have this, like, this mantra we're constantly talking about with our own kids, like, yeah, that's your penis, because God made you so good. And it's for maybe making life one day, but it's private, and it's special, and we don't touch it, and blah, blah, blah. And so... So th that's sort of like the, how we've approached this question with our own children. Constantly telling, us, t constantly telling them that God created them, God made them so good, your body is so good, um, that you are so special, you're a gift from God, and your whole body is a gift from God, every single part of it. So what are our bodies for? They are for God. Okay, so a couple of things just from my own counseling background that are um, just apply to our talking to our children about their bodies. Um, this came up with the, the quote, I think, where if we teach our children what true love is, then they'll be able to recognize all of its counterfeits, right? So if we teach our children what their bodies are for early on or just at whatever point we are now, then hopefully our children can recognize, you know, an illicit use of their body, even as young children. And so I just want to say, like, people, there are bad people in the world who abuse children, and there are there's only so much we can do as parents. So I'm not saying that there's some like checklist or something we can do to like know for sure that nothing bad will ever happen to our children. But there are things we can do to at least hopefully, um, again, prepare our children and help them to hopefully disclose to us as parents if they ever do feel uncomfortable, if anything does happen to them that does make them, that is harmful to them. So we always name body parts. So name, call them by name, like from zero up. You know, this is your vagina, this is your penis, whatever it might be, this is your bottom. And we talk about all the private areas and your private areas that are special that no one should be touching without your permission and no one should be looking at or touching unless it's mommy or daddy or a doctor. If mommy and daddy are in the room, it's their mouth. That's private and that's special as well. It's their vagina or their penis and it's their bottom. And so that these are just, we're constantly reminding our children, you know, just we're, I'm making lunch like, okay, Tell me all your parts that are private and special. And this is why I try and make sure they know what they're called and, and that we, we continually name them. Um, we don't touch or play with our private areas because they're so special. Not because it's like bad or dirty or don't touch that, but because they're just so special. It's such a gift from God. We don't touch them or play with them. So with little kids, it's so natural for children. They're exploring their bodies or just stick their hands in their diapers or whatever it might be. We always just say, hands up, that's special. Hands up, that's private. And so that's just something that we've always said to our kids. Um, and then there's always sort of like a list of questions I run through with my kids, basically as soon as they can talk and as soon as they can, you know, understand. And essentially, and we just review these, you know, randomly or whenever it comes up or if they're ever going to be in the care of an adult who maybe I don't know super well or just even going to a friend's house. So these questions are, should anyone ever touch your private areas? And they say, no. What should you do if anyone ever touches your private areas? I should run away and tell mommy or an adult immediately. Um, should anyone ever look at your private areas? Should anyone ever take a picture of your private areas? Should anyone ever tell you to look at or touch their private areas? Should anyone ever show you a picture of someone else's private areas? What if someone tells you to do something and not tell mommy? 
will you ever get in trouble if you tell mommy or daddy about any of these things? And obviously the answer is no. Like, will you ever get in trouble if anyone ever tells you X, Y, and Z? The answer is always no. You can always tell mommy and daddy. You can always talk to us if you feel uncomfortable. So trying to always keep that door open, because oftentimes what predators do is they tell children that you will get in trouble if you disclose, or I will go to jail if you disclose, or you don't want, you don't want to hurt me by telling anyone. And so I just, we just tell our children, if anyone ever says, that you'll get in trouble if you tell mommy and daddy. Is that true, yes or no? And so we, I mean, we really, these practical things, and this is, you know, straight out of my counseling office when I was counseling kids and we're doing all this, like, psychosexual education with them too. So this is something that's just basic that we can all be doing that just really helps our children, again, understand the, the specialness of their bodies and understand what the, the, their, how they're named and sometimes the tactics that predators use to try and get to children. And then the last thing we always, we always try and ask this frequently is just, do you have any questions for me, you know, about anything? About last night, Silas, on my way out of the door, checked me in and he said, why doesn't God just kill Satan? And I was like, okay, well, <laughs> I'll have Father Michael over soon. <laughs> I'll talk about it. Um, anyway, just go to bed. No. But so, but questions like, has anyone ever made you feel unsafe? Do you have any questions about your body? Is there anything, you know, going on with your body that you want to ask us about? Just, just try and always keep that door open and just... Name it and say it, even if I feel uncomfortable, that we're just always kind of trying to keep that door wide open because they're only going to get older and there's only going to be bigger, more questions and more changes happening. And so, th so that's sort of some just very practical things that we do with our small children. And then finally, um, so there's body safety, then there's also mental safety as well. So Ryan and I are super hardcore just about screens because in our own counseling experiences, whether in youth ministry, young adults ministry, our counseling experiences, Essentially, children just have a very hard time having a life of faith, of having a life of prayer, of having a life of contemplation, or just a, a joyful life if they are hooked on a screen, right? And we all know this because we all have phones and we all find ourselves like hooked on social media or hooked on whatever it might be, and it's just, you know, magnify that times a thousand for children. So our children don't have personal screens. We've chosen to, to not make screen time ever like an individual thing. They can do it as a community, as children watch a show together on the TV. Um, and we're also just very careful. Um, we don't have our children go to other child's house if they have access to the internet on a personal device. We just, we're too paranoid, and it's happened too often that children are looking accidentally or just, you know, natural curiosity. They're not bad children, but sometimes you even stumble upon things or you just want to know about how stuff works, so you just look on the internet, and unfortunately, you can find anything on the internet. Oftentimes, filters only go so far, and children are really smart. They can hide apps, they can find new apps and not tell you about it, or they can, you know, conceal server history or whatever it might be, and so we've just chosen, just to eliminate all of that, our children do not have screens, and they don't have um, any device with the internet on it, um, and we're also super careful about which children they're allowed to play with who may have the internet on their own phones. So we really care about these circles of influence for our children. So whether it's, you know, their media access or it's just who they're with, in this young age, if we just really feel like it's our job to just protect our children, we want to make them so strongly rooted in the gospel and their understanding of their bodies and their human sexuality that they can be um, truly formed in that and then one day when they're older go on to hopefully live a life of, um, you know, a witness to the faith and a witness to Jesus. And so, so we're really hardcore about screens and um, really hardcore about just what entertainment we're, we allow our children to watch. Because unfortunately, I think there's just a lot of infiltration in the media industry now that, that everyone's preaching a gospel. And we care a lot about if this gospel is in line with the truth of Christ and the truth of you know, our Christian vision of the world. And unfortunately, there's just a lot of things out there that, that aren't. A prime example would be, in my own counseling experience, even young children, maybe they're really into drawing, as an example. So maybe they have friends, or they're really into drawing, like anime, as an example. So this is super popular, right? I know it's everywhere, and I'm not condemning anyone who draws anime. Of course I'm not. But I am saying that there's just a very known infiltration of the transgender ideology and the pornography industry into the anime world. So while parents may think my child's just learning to draw this cool cartoon thing in this imaginary world, but it's not, it's not neutral. It's not a neutral place. The internet usually has an agenda. And so we as parents, I think, just need to be so careful about what we're allowing our children to be exposed to because we, often we think it's just art or it's just Disney or it's just a show, but often there's subliminal messaging happening and it's just so important for us as parents to be aware that the world is not a Christian place. 
our, the things we're streaming in our media, it's not a Christian place. And so I just, I just want to say, just to always have your guard up as parents, because we just, Ryan and I's policy is that nothing enters our kids' brains that hasn't gone through ours first. That we haven't just vetted and filtered whatever it is that they're watching or whatever it is that they're, they're doing. And believe me, we're not like anti-screen. Like the afternoon show time in my household, you know, that's that's how dinner gets made. So I'm not like we like TV, we like movies, we, we like we enjoy all those things. But it's just Ryan and I try and model that too, you know, as far as what we are watching as well. And so we just care a lot, obviously, for our children too. And so that's essentially it. And so this is sort of the groundwork we're trying to lay in our own family. And so. Um, I have a whole basket of books and more resources out there. If you wanted to flip through any of them, feel free. And um, I'll be here after. So if you have any questions for me in particular, please feel free to reach out to me or to Ryan, who is a counselor here. And you can make an appointment with him anytime. And you can always talk to him as well. So again, thank you for listening to me. And I hope everyone knows that this is all aspirational in our own family. We're not perfect, but just thank you all. I just appreciate this community and helping us raise our kids together in the faith. And yes, and just thank you for listening to our story. Thank you. Thank you to Margaret. Um, And if I may just add one more thing, I was so appreciative of you outlining specifically those questions about um, like that you kind of regularly go through as far as like kind of like predators and grooming, that sort of thing. And one that our children actually asked us, I'm just going to add one to your list which is, and I know it's nauseating to think of these things. I know, like, I know, like, none of, we, none of us, we wish we didn't have to have these conversations, but this is the world we live in. Um, one of our daughters said, well, what if somebody threatens to hurt you if I tell? So that was another, just, again, like, you know, where she got the notion or the idea, or, or maybe I brought that up, I'm not sure, but just, just one more thing to throw out there. I mean, imagine receiving that threat as a child. I'm going to hurt your family. I'm going to hurt your mommy or daddy if you tell anybody. That's going to shut a kid up really quick. And so a same, same thing. We try and have some of those. Just kind of imagine the worst-case scenarios, and, and we do the best we can. So thank you. Y'all are an awesome witness for all of us. Um, okay, so Father Michael's going to come up and continue to – help us chew on the meat of theology of the body, going to take us kind of one step further and deeper into this teaching. And then after that, we, uh, he and I together are going to kind of tag team some of those questions, just like we did last week. So we're going to forego the small group time tonight so that he's got a bit more time to go into the teaching, and then we've got some more time to spend on some of those specific Q&A, those questions. Okay, so Father Michael, you want to say a quick prayer over you? May we do that? I'll do a quicker one, quicker prayer. So one more prayer over our pastor, because our priests, especially pastors, need all the prayer they can get. So if you want to extend those hands, Lord God, we just pray again. We ask for a fresh outpouring of your Holy Spirit upon our pastor, our priest, your son, your beloved son, Father Michael. And we just thank you, God, for the gifts that you have given him. Thank you for um, his own personal passion for this teaching. And thank you for his ability to bring this gift to all of us and to present it, uh, just to present it in a way that speaks to all of our hearts. And so, God, I just pray that you would speak through him, that you would be his voice, that you would use his lips and his tongue and his brain and all parts of his body to clearly articulate your truth and your love to all of us. Amen. Amen. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Why don't we stand up for a second if you want to, because you've been sitting for a little while. All right. Jesus. Thank you, Lord. When we sing a hymn, praise God from whom all blessings flow, praise him all creatures here below, praise him above ye heavenly hosts, praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. You can have a seat or remain standing, really do whatever you want. And we're going to be going over this, this handout, uh, Theology of the Body for Parents, Part 3. Again, if you're watching online, it, the, the link for it is in the description there. Um, so, uh, so that'll help you follow along here. And we're, we're diving in today to the wound of sin and the victory of the cross. Um, so we've talked a bit about kind of our origins in God. Um, remember, they bring that painful question to Jesus about, about divorce and remarriage, and Jesus points them back to the beginning. In the beginning, it was not so. So, we, so John Paul II, in his Theology of the Body, spends a lot of time 
reflecting on those original experiences of Adam and Eve before the fall. So original, uh, original uh, um, solitude, original nakedness, original unity, that the two were both naked and they were not ashamed. That's something so important, I think, too, because we recognize the controlling and destructive power of shame in, 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 um, uh, since the fall. And so many of us, too, most of our, our encounters with teachings on sex and sexuality, even in, in within the Christian context, usually have a shame basis to them. The, and so, so recognizing, too, that God's not calling us to a shamelessness, which is the world's reaction to this, of just like, just be naked and just have sex with whatever you want to have sex with. Like, that, that actually brings a whole other set of problems. But instead, it's this integrated understanding of my body, of my person, of who I am, whose I am, the goodness of my body, why I was created a male, why I was created a man, the purpose that, that I have, and all that comes, re, manifests and is lived in and through the body. Um, so, but the wound of sin, and we're going to get into some of the particulars of sin too, and, and, and beginning the conversation of how we talk about this uh, as well. There were so many, so many points from uh, Margaret sharing today that I was very blessed by and continue to be blessed by, so thank you so much, Margaret, and, and, uh, and Man, there, there's a lot there, too, and, uh, and I think, too, coming from the place of, of, of seeing the really painful, horrific damages of sexual abuse in children. So thank you, first of all, for, for ministering there and, and, and helping those kids that have gone through that. Uh, but recognizing, too, not to over, be overdramatic, but in a sense that all of us, in various ways, have those lies that have been spoken over us. That we come into a world that's fallen, and that's why Jesus points them back to the beginning, not just because of recognizing how great it was before the fall, but to recognize, to really begin to ask, answer that question of why are things so messed up now? And to, and to see that we come into a world that we didn't create this world, we didn't create our bodies, and it's a fallen world. So if the world is fallen, our family is, has, has, has the wound of sin, and our own our own experience of our humanity, our own integrity of body and spirit and mind are wounded by sin. So that, all of that influences and affects the way that we view the world. So in a sense, when we hear the gospel of the body, the theology of the body, we're hearing the good news. We talked about the ultimate good news that Jesus Christ, uh, who, who, God who created us, we were captured by sin, that God sent his son God in the, in the second person of the Blessed Trinity to lay down his life for us, to die for us, to save us from the tyranny of sin and to fill us with his life so that we can be on mission with him and reign gloriously with him forever in heaven. Um, that how that impacts and illuminates our understanding of our, our own bodies, our own selves. Because again, as we've been saying, so often the way that we've learned about sex, the way that we've learned about what our bodies do, what is, what is the, the purpose of a penis and a vagina? What is, what is their right orientation? How should they be used? So often we've learned that not in light of the God who made us, but from the gutter or from something much worse. And so we've experienced that. And then not only that, we've also participated in the lie by our own sins. So as I bring up things tonight, just to recognize we have an enemy, he hates you, and he is called the accuser. So as I bring this stuff up, the enemy wants to accuse. The same one that tempted you to sin, that's one of the problems with the devil. He tempts us towards sin, and he's like, do this, do this sin, you'll be happy, you'll be... And then once we do the sin, he says, like, you are such a piece of garbage. If you ever hear after a sin, you are such a piece of garbage, that is not the voice of the Holy Spirit. That is not how God talks, okay? Just a quick discernment there. Quick discernment check. That's the voice of the enemy. No, I'm God's beloved. What I have done is beneath my dignity. It needs to be repented of and turned from. But I never get freedom by t telling myself I'm a piece of garbage. I don't shame myself to the glory of God. Okay? So for, as you hear this for yourself, obviously we're talking about this in light of how we share this with those that have been entrusted to our care, whether grandchildren or children or future children or family members or friends. But hearing this for ourselves too, the enemy always rushes in to accuse. And even as you're hearing Margaret's beautiful description of having these these early and often conversations with, with her children. I know the tactic of the enemy for you is as your kids are already grown or out of the house or past, you know, the age where you can pick them up and move them to the place you want them to be. 
that the enemy could be like, oh, if only you had done more, if only you had said the right thing, if only you had, all again, that, that voice of accusation. So we silence that voice in the name of Jesus. May only the voice of the Father be heard in this place and in your own hearts. So if you've got a Bible, great. Uh, if not, don't worry about it. I'll read it for you. Matthew chapter 5. And we're talking about the wound of sin and the victory of the cross because sin does wound. There's a, a trauma that uh, sin inflicts upon us and that, we, uh, and that trauma gets intensified when we participate in sin. Um, and obviously sexual sins are nothing new. It goes all the way back to the beginning, those sexual sins. But we have in this, in this new world that we're in a society that encourages them. It's interesting, it's a society that encourages sexual sin and at the same time rushes to accuse people of sexual sin at the same time. So it's a, it's a, very, it's a very interesting kind of um, uh, world that we're in right now. So it doesn't have the mercy of God's forgiveness and healing and doesn't have the truth of what, uh, uh, of what, uh, what we are made for that calls us to live our sexuality with virtue and purity and integrity. Um, so we, we've, we've missed out on those, so we all suffer because of that. But we, again, when we say this isn't just the, the big bad world out there. Now there are big bad components in the pornography industry, in, in, um, in advertising and, and savage capitalism that objectifies and exploits the human person. But all of this is right here. It's all here. And it's all probably right there too, okay? So that this is where the battle rages. So in Matthew chapter 5, verses 21 to 28... <clears throat> we'll go a little bit, uh, we'll go to 27 and 28 first, okay? Because this, this, this is one of these lines that John Paul II spends a lot of time meditating on. He says, you have heard that it was said, in Matthew 5, 27, you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, everyone who looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Now this is a fascinating, powerful, profound, and, sh and really challenging way of viewing this okay so adultery so if you think about this so jesus is speaking to these these uh these men and women these people that have come for the sermon on the mount and a lot of them the pharisees the leaders of the people that knew the scriptures and the law of god was thou shalt not commit adultery and thou shalt not commit adultery meant you know that i don't have sex with someone that's somebody else's spouse and if i'm married to someone that i don't have sex outside of that relationship so in a sense you could be like check I have never done that before. I've never done that exact action. So then Jesus, he's, he says, you have heard that it was said, the law, but I say to you, not, and Jesus doesn't get rid of the law. He's not like, ah, just do whatever you want, as long as it feels good. You know, just, just, you know, love, you know, just, just, just love, love people. You know, like, no, Jesus actually intensifies the demands of the law but in a way that's an invitation to, to deeper relationship, okay? So he says, but I say to you, everyone who looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. I remember, so John Paul II, when he was giving his, his uh, uh, talks on the theology of the body over five years, we're doing it in four weeks, we're, we're just that smart, um, over these five years, one of the things that he, that, you know, because every once in a while, something the Pope says the news will report on, which is always funny. It's like me giving like a, like a in-depth report on like a, you know, what a scientist has said or something like that. A scientist is like, oh, you know, these molecules do such and such. Me being like, well, let me comment on that a little bit, right? Because I have no expertise. I have no understanding. I got straight B's and C's in science in high school, not to brag or flex on you guys too much there. Um, you know, so to recognize, so when the news reports on something the Pope has said, always take that with a grain of salt because they usually don't know what they're talking about and don't know the context in which it is said. So John Paul II, brilliant philosopher, theologian, and he's, he's giving this, these talks on the theology of the body. He's setting the stage for the church's difficult and demanding teachings on sex, uh, on sex as the free, faithful, and fruitful gift of self between a man and a woman that is the, the, uh, this sign of God's love that is necessarily oriented towards life, towards new, new life brought into this world. And he says that a man cannot, shall not, should not lust after anyone, not even his own wife. Should not lust after his wife. And people are like, what the hell are you talking about? They're like, you know, like, what? Like, if a guy can't lust after his wife, who can he lust after? It's like, exactly. 
Exactly, because what we mean by lust is something maybe different than the culture and society understands by lust. So lust is different than sexual attraction. Hopefully a man is, is attracted to his wife. That is a very good thing. And actually we talk about uh, uh, attraction as the creator's own gift. We mentioned that last week, that God gives us the mutual attraction between the sexes as his own gift. But when I reduce someone created in the image and likeness of God, made to reign with God for all eternity, when I reduce them to a body part, when I reduce them to an object that I can use and manipulate emotionally, physically, however, to give me something, then I've entered into this world of lust, and that is a sin. It is a sin against the dignity of that person, and it is a sin against the dignity of myself. And it is, it is in a sense, a blasphemy because I'm taking something holy and sacred and, and dragging it into my, my own needs to, to satisfy my own wants. So what does that mean then, if a husband cannot lust after his wife, that a husband must see in his wife not a means to an end, then the same thing goes for a woman, that if a woman can lust after her husband, objectify her husband, maybe in different ways. Again, you know, you know we recognize that uh, whenever we give a descriptor of, of male or female or man or, men or women, this isn't like a, an exhaustive thing. That means women never do this or men never do that. But recognizing that this can manifest in different ways. That whether it's a physical manipulation or an emotional manipulation or using this person for what they can give me, that is a, to recognize that in our own hearts and to say, oh, I, I'm actually called to love in a new way, which is the way Jesus, again, this is always the model, the way that Jesus loves his bride. The bridegroom Jesus on the cross, the way that he loves his bride. He's not here on the cross saying, what are you going to do for me? He gives himself completely in the gift of love. Completely. In spite of even the fact that we're, we're actually killing him, you know, we the bride are nailing him to the cross, and yet he still pours himself out in love. Now, that's, that's, the, that's the source and the summit of the way that we're called to love others with, with our bodies, and particularly in married relationships. To say, how can I be a gift to this person? How can I give myself um, in, in a way that is life-giving? So Jesus talks about this sin of adultery, and that it, ha- it can't just be like, I don't do these actions, I'm in these guardrails, and my heart is, is giving way to lust and objectification. No, that that, that counts too. That I need to, to love the person well. But directly before this is this, this other uh, section here in the Sermon on the Mount. He says, you have heard that it was said to your ancestors, in verse 21, you shall not kill, and whoever kills will be liable to judgment. But I say to you, whoever is angry, whoever is wrathful towards his brother will be liable to judgment. And whoever says to his brother, Raka, this is a real bad insult apparently, will be answerable answerable to the Sanhedrin. Whoever says, you fool, will be liable to fiery Gehenna. And he talks about reconciliation between brothers. If you go to to the altar to leave your gift, and I think this, um, to be reconciled, and you have something, your brother has something against you, go be reconciled with him before you, you bring your gift to the Lord, which is one of the reasons that Mass, we have that sign of peace, before we receive Jesus in the Eucharist, before we approach the altar, we make peace with our brothers and sisters. And if there's someone that you're hating in your heart, I would say don't come to communion. Maybe come up and receive a blessing, but to be, seek to be reconciled there. So it's interesting that Jesus deepens also, before he goes into the thing on adultery, he gets into this thing about murder. I've never killed anyone. I'm good, check, right? But then he says this deeper sense, what about this hatred in your heart? And I think this is really important. We're going to talk a little bit about how these sins affect boys and girls in, in, in different ways. But in particular, anger. So often, particularly for young men, but not exclusively, sexual sins and the way that we deal with them or don't deal with them are tied into the way that we deal with or don't deal with anger. That we, and particularly as a society, we generally don't reward people flipping out and getting angry, right? 
we generally like, oh, that's, that's, a, that's a good guy right there, right? You know, we tend to, to award people who act, act out sexually as long as they do it in an attractive way and, and you know, as, as, you know all these, as long as it's like, you know, Brad Pitt or something like that. If it's, if it's someone who doesn't look like that, then we, then we get really angry about it. We get upset with them. So think about this, too, because anger is one of those emotions, just like sexual desire, that's given to us by God. So think about that. God equipped you as a human person with this capacity called anger. It is a powerful capacity. It is a, it is a powerful, it is strong. Wars have been fought. Lives have been taken because of this reality within us, within the human heart. But it's not in and of itself evil. It's what we do with it. Which, where it's directed, how it's manifested, that can become either life-giving or destructive. And again, I'm saying this about anger and see the corollary with sexual desire. There's a direct corollary there. So think about that, for, for, you know, for example. So God gave us the emotion of anger as the appropriate emotional response to injustice. Mary, conceived without original sin, got angry did not fall into sin, that Jesus, it actually tells us in the gospel, got angry. He, there's moments in the gospel where he gets angry. He never sinned, but he did get angry. So think about that, of like, how do we teach young people to deal with anger? Is it just stuff it all down? Just be nice? Just be quiet? Just don't make a fuss? You got offended by that? I don't really care. You know, just, you, you know, I have, I have your sibling to deal with who's got all sorts of problems, so you need to be the one that has no problems at all, to recognize how we can convey that teaching explicitly or implicitly, and that in a sense what we're teaching without meaning to can be this part of your humanity is bad. It doesn't go away. I don't know if you've tried to do that, stuff down anger. It's not like, a, oh, it's gone. Oh, magic, right? Like sexual desire, just be like, just don't think about it anymore. It's gone. Don't have it anymore. That, that's not how this works, right? Because it's part of our humanity. So God only saves us as human persons. The totality of our humanity needs to be redeemed and transformed. And so there's a strong corollary. So maybe even thinking about that, of how do we deal with anger? Maybe you think, well, I've got a temper problem. I've got an anger problem for myself, so I don't deal. And then, like, the kids do that too. So to say, how do we talk about that? in the midst of it? How do we lead up to it? How do we find new ways of expressing that anger that gets away from either the blowing up or the passive-aggressive kind of, kind of way of dealing with things? To have honest and difficult conversations. To be able to say, can I still love somebody? Can I ask somebody for forgiveness where I step out of line there? All right, so Jesus sets that up for us. So we, think, we talked a little bit about this, about the wounds that we've experienced we think about abuse that so many people have been, have been impacted by. We think of the shame and the distortion that all this has been created good, but it's been wounded by sin, so that shame enters in, and we'll look a little bit more at Adam and Eve, and the distortion that the enemy brings. So, so how to talk about sin. So, so, we so we began this last week. Adam and Eve are a great place to start. I think this is a great Lexio reflection to do with your kids um, to open up the Bible and be like, let's, let's read this and let's talk about how this has something to do with our own lives. So Adam and Eve are created good by a good and loving God. They're naked without shame. Then, then the enemy tempts them. They turn away from God. Then all of a sudden they're isolated from each other. And that's a great question to ask. When you do something wrong, do you feel like you have to hide yourself? Do you feel like that, that reality of, of um, I'm bad now? Yeah, I do feel that. So, so then we can almost kind of like retell that story too, like, what if in that moment, when Adam's hiding himself, what if he stepped out towards God and said, God, I sinned, and I'm so sorry. And I didn't love and defend my bride, Eve, and I, I turned away from what you told me to do. Please forgive me. Like, to think about that, if, if, imagine if Adam said that to God. Do you think God would have been like, no way, no, God is, we know God is forgiving, he's merciful. But instead, what does Adam do? He sins, he hides himself. And then he accuses Eve, then he accuses God, the woman that you put here with me, into this place of accusation and shame. 
So to even to begin to think about that, that that might be a good way to to talk about that, that Adam and Eve, too, they hide their bodies from each other, not because their bodies became bad, their bodies, but all of a sudden the way that they looked at each other has the potential now, you know, because sin has entered in, to be use, to be lust, to be objectification. And we realize, we recognize, much we try to numb ourselves to it, that we're not supposed to be looked at that way. So evil, too, whenever we talk about evil, it's, a, it's in Catholic understanding, evil is a privation of the good. Evil doesn't exist on its own. It's, it's not the, the light and the dark side of the force, like this battle against who's going to win. No, God and the good is reality. The evil is the cancerous growth on the side of good. It, it leeches off of good. Darkness doesn't exist. Does that make sense? It doesn't have an existence in and of itself. It is the absence of light. So we talk about evil, it's important to, to recognize that um, and, and to bring that out to uh, just in the conversation. Also, too, something else when we're talking about sin, this is a great quote from Pope Benedict XVI, that the world promises you comfort, but you are not made for comfort, you are made for greatness. This life of virtue to which we are called, and I'm so glad uh, Margaret highlighted the saints as well, because those are men and women who have gone against that trend towards comfort, towards doing whatever brings me pleasure. And we live in the most pleasure-happy uh, society in the history of, of the world. Again, you know, they walk in here in this giant church, and there's air conditioning here, there's lights, there's, I've got very comfortable shoes on right now. And if any of those things was off, I'd be like, what is going on? The air was weird in there. It was not blowing at the exact speed I wanted it to. And my, I had a, I had a little... My shoe was a little strange. I would complain about it and go look about getting, again, no other society in the history of humanity has had the comfort that we have. And so we get used to that and begin to say that that permeates the way I approach everything, the way I approach food, the way I approach entertainment. I'm bored. Bleep. It's right there. It's right there. Or it's right there. Right? I think, I think Margaret's rules for screens, I, I, should, I should have her be my screen mom. Or just, I don't, I don't have them at all. The only things I can watch is when I go over to their house while she's cooking dinner and watch, you know, whatever it is, Paw Patrol or something like that. You know, I'd probably be a much better person for that. But in a sense, like Jeff Bezos and Tim Cook and all these people, they understand this infinite desire that we have and this slide towards comfort and towards entertainment. So when I feel stressed, when I feel anxious, when I feel tired, when I feel lonely, when I feel bored, I have something to fill that. When I feel hungry, I have something to fill that. And so why would we think sexual desire would be satisfied in, any, in, in a different way? As soon as you feel sexual desire, you satisfy it, really by any means necessary. And we have all the apparatuses in our society that are telling you not only that you should do that, but anything that keeps you from doing that is bad. The only bad thing is to tell someone no in that area. So recognizing from a young age and for every single one of us that we're called to not live for comfort but to live for the greatness of being in a relationship with God. Fasting is a great example of this. Do you, do you like, fasting is an essential part of the Christian faith, of, of our asceticism, of saying no to something. Food is, is the best of things, right? I mean, it's up there, definitely. It's gotta be in the top three. But to be able to say no to that I want to make space. I want to feel that hunger so I can, I can make more time for prayer today. And the money I would have spent, I'm going to give that to the poor. That's a whole season of Lent right there. We take 40 days to do that as, as a church, to cultivate um, virtue so we're not living the lies of this world. Because the reality is when you live for comfort, you end up being very, very uncomfortable. Living for pleasure doesn't lead to pleasure. It leads to heartbreak and anxiety and hatred, self-hatred and destruction. That's where that leads. So when we talk about sexual sin, and again, conversations early and often, and even when we talk about, you know, like, you know, that you don't play with your penis or vagina, you know, that, that you, don't, you don't do this or play with someone else's or, or, or allow someone to touch you to touch someone else's, we say that not because they're bad, but because they're good. Because they're good that we're made in the image and likeness of God. Christianity is not Puritanism. Christianity, and I think this is important for us to recognize that kind of the puritanical movements in the church, 
there might have been some good intentions behind them. A lot of them have affected and impacted us that when we recognize in the early days of, of Christianity that Jesus did not, when he was crucified, he had no clothes on. He had no clothes on. So our salvation comes to us from a Jewish man. Again, this, is, this, was, this was, was a place of shame and, and, and shame for, for uh, and, you know, uh, for the Jewish people, confusion for, for the Greek and Roman people that were encountered this story, that someone so like subjected to this could be our savior. There's something powerful within that to heal our own wounds of shame and our own wounds of, of objectification of the body. So sexual sin, again, these conversations should happen early and often, and t- was when we're intentionally removing the sexual act from the sacrament of marriage. That there, there's a direction that we're called to live our sexuality. The union of, 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 of the, uh, the man's body and the woman's body, which is good. It's not just good, it's actually holy. Think about the sexual union within the sacrament of marriage is, this sounds crazy, is just as much of a sacrament as baptism. It's just as much of a sacrament as the Eucharist. So this is something holy and profound angels tremble to go here the glory of god is revealed here so if you were the devil what would you attack obviously he does he only attacks what's important if sex were not important the devil would not attack it and it wouldn't hurt so bad when we're wounded in those areas too as much as we try to say like it's really not that important who you have sex with or what you do or how you experiment i could say for my years as a priest my 11 years as a priest my almost 39 years as a as a sinner I'm sure anyone who's in any, any sort of counseling background can, can attest to this as well, that the, the, the wounds in those areas of our, of our sexuality are profound, profound, because it is important. But it also includes using the sexual sin, using persons as objects to elicit sexual desire, or using our bodies as objects as well. So we think about this, so we live in a porn, pornography-saturated world, God have mercy on us, um, to recognize, too, that... Uh, that those, the, the, the attraction towards pornography, the attraction towards pornography is real. I, I have a place of attraction towards bodies or people or, 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 um, or curiosity. All those things are real. But unfortunately, too, in, in the world that we, we're living in right now, that pornography kind of jumps over natural attraction and goes immediately towards not just describing, but... Uh, simulating and putting forward sexual acts. So one of the great struggles and and problems that we face today is that children that don't even yet have sexual desire properly, that haven't gone through puberty yet, that they're being exposed to explicit pornographic images and materials and videos that in a sense form their minds before their minds are even ready, don't even have the capacity to understand it. So to recognize too, and we're going to talk a little bit towards the end about what do we do where someone has experienced that, a child in our life, someone that we have care for, how do we, how do we pray with that? How do we help to begin to redeem that in addition to counseling and other means as well? So masturbation, which is, is self-pleasure towards climax, that's basically what that is. So recognizing that the church says that that's a sin, again, not because your body is bad, but because your body means something. It either means something or it means nothing, people. <laughs> And it means something profound. And the sexual act, to simulate the sexual act outside of that, that is a sin. Again, not so that you're shamed and you're bad and you're dirty and don't, don't touch that or, or like God will cut your hand off or something. None, none of those sorts of things. But because it's such a good reality, that we don't, we don't take it out from, from uh, the goodness of its context and use it for our own ends. Think about this, that we live in a society... It sounds kind of crass, and I don't mean it to be, but we live in a society that the paradigm of sex, the backdrop, the form of sex as it is learned and taught is masturbation, self-pleasure. That's how we've learned about sex in our society. That's how we talk about it and experience it. So being able to talk about that as as the antithesis of what we're made for, which is self-gift, which is I pour myself out in love towards another and self-sacrificial love. And that love is so real between the husband and wife that, again, a child comes into this world as a gift and fruit of that love. A child who doesn't care about how you feel, doesn't care about what you, <laughs> how you slept that night, in a sense becomes this great 
ask of you, this great task and responsibility, that's actually what sex is about. Because it begins to form our hearts into love in a godlike way. And masturbation is the opposite of that. Also, the voyeurism that we live in nowadays, this being able to see and know the details of other people's lives. Think about this, too. Social media thrives on that. And I would say this as for us as adults. You know, most of us have some sort of social media account, and it can very easily fall into that for us. Even though I'm not looking at porn, I'm not looking at that, but how I can begin to look at other people's lives and objectify and question, and I can't believe she parents that way, all these sorts of things that we can fall into that is a voyeurism, is an objectification of the person that in a sense I'm looking at a private moment to which I should have reverence. If I was ever brought into that moment, I think about this as a priest, I'm brought into a lot of moments, intimate moments of people's lives where all of a sudden just because I'm a priest, I'm there and it's there in the hospital room or the hospice bed in 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 their home. And imagine if I were crass in that circumstance or if I were snapping pictures of it and telling people about it. We would be justly horrified by that, right? Justly horrified by that. But in a sense, we, because of the internet age that we're in, we live in a voyeuristic society where we can start to normalize that. Having this intimate peek into somebody's life, again, not just celebrities, in a sense, everybody's a celebrity now, but into any, any person, and I begin to, to use that, it makes my, me feel better. It's kind of like when we watch Cops, right? Watch Cops, because you'd be like, oh, yeah, I'm glad it's happening to that guy and not me, right? You know, that, maybe that's just a guy thing. I'm not really sure. But, yes, yeah, so, so there, there's something about that, that voyeuristic tendency that we have. And to recognize that can come up about in kids as well. And to say, like, like oh, I heard this about this, this, this other kid. Or I heard this is going on in their house. I heard, I heard his dad left. Like, do, do you all say, like, if that's true and we don't know if it's true, I'm sure that he's very sad. So why don't we say a prayer for him right now? To be able to engage in those ways, again, not that it doesn't ever come at the perfect time, it's never, it's never always easy and clear, but to continue to say, can we fight for the humanity of people that we haven't even met? Because that's what we need to do. So objectifying the human body, and we think about this too within the health and fitness world, um, if you're ever on Instagram or something like that, don't search for health and fitness. Just don't do it, because in a sense, it's automatically going to go towards objectified bodies. That, that's the direction that it goes. Not that health and fitness are bad. They're actually, they're actually quite good. Praise God for them. But in a sense, the tendency in the world divorced from God usually goes towards that, that objectified bodies. This name-calling, this reducing of people to body parts, the way that we talk about other people is, is really, really important. So attraction, the Creator's own gift, is reduced to manipulation and control. So many of our sexual sins fall into that. So again, Jesus' words, if you look at a woman with lust, you've committed adultery with her in your heart. So I'm going to skip down a couple lines here, uh, just a little bit about the devil, and then we'll talk about how this affects uh, women and men, um, young women and young young men. So the devil is a liar. He can't make anything new. He can't create. The devil's not a creator. He didn't create sex. He didn't create sexual desire. It's created by God. The devil can't make a grasshopper, just recognizing that. He is not a a co-eternal entity with God. So what he does do is he lies and he he twists and he manipulates. And uh, as in in the words of uh, the gospel, the devil is a liar and a murderer from the beginning. He's a counterfeiter. So he counterfeits. So you think of sexual sin is the counterfeit of the real thing that we're made for. Not just sex within marriage, but the real thing, sexual sin, is the counterfeit of union with God. Because sex always points beyond itself if it's authentic. So he counterfeits. Thinking of thinking this too as lust and sinful anger, let's put it that way, as hijackers of the good emotions and attract, attractions that we have. That, that image of hijacking, I'm going to share a, um, <laughs> a reference to a book called um, Unwanted by Jay Springer that is very good. And he talks about hijacking. So think about this even in terms of explaining this to kids like the September 11th horrific Uh, uh, attacks on our country the hijacked planes are the planes good yes did the planes work well yes right but they're hijacked by something to be used towards a destructive end so to think about anger when it is hijacked by the by the enemy and so it's it's used towards hurting somebody towards balling up my my hand into a fist and punching somebody or towards spreading a rumor about somebody or towards being passive aggressive and hating that person in my heart over and over again 
It's being hijacked. So think about this too with sexual desire to say that that is a good thing. It's actually something that's going right when I'm attracted to somebody else, when I'm fascinated, even that fascination, that's a good thing. But it gets hijacked so easily towards using and manipulating and tearing down and this secret of how much pleasure can I get out of this person. So to think about that, uh, that, that image just made sense to me. I heard it just the other day, and, and so maybe in your own conversations here. So the redemption of the body. So we have sexual sin, and then we have the redemption of the body. Even when sexual sin is talked about, I would say you should talk about it. It should be something that's discussed. You should talk about always in light of the redemption. So what is a boy's body made for? It's made to love. It's made to love like Jesus loves. It's made, if you're called to marriage, you're, you're called to love your wife. You're called to serve your wife. You're called to work with your hands and build her up. And you're called, your body, your penis is united to your wife. And that is a a sign of your gift of love. Not because you're taking, but because you're giving yourself to her. And it's so powerful that sometimes God brings a new life into this world through that. There's the redemption of the body. Reclaiming what the enemy wants to claim. None of it is his. I say this a lot, that when we're in Christ... No part of you belongs to the devil, not even your sin. Not even your sin. It all belongs to the Lord. So the body belongs to the Lord, as St. Paul tells us. <clears throat> so to untwist what sin is twisted and learning to see the human body with purity, the glory of God in the human body. And this is tied to meditation and contemplation. I think about this. I remember I was on, uh, my first time I did an eight-day retreat, eight-day silent retreat. And it was, it was intense. And like you met once a day with your, your spiritual director and you discussed things and you, you, throughout the day you would read a scripture passage and you'd put yourself in the scene. What do you see? And what do you taste? And what do you smell? As they're, they're doing the great catch of fish, you know, some scene from the gospel. And one of the guys on, on the retreat, he commented, we were, we were discussing at the end, he said, he said, I've never experienced using my imagination for God. So think about that. The imagination is incredible incredible reality and how often it's merely either daydreaming you know kind of inert entertainment or whatever or very sinful in lust in perversion in, in undressing people in our minds in saying how i'm going to get back at that person oh i should have said this and i should have said if they said that i would have punched them right in the face and like we, you know this um, our imagination gets to this place but imagine if we began to cultivate our imagination with reflecting on being there when Jesus breaks the bread at the Last Supper and says, take this, all of you, eat of it. This is my body given up for you. What do I see and what do I taste and what do I smell? What do I hear? What do I feel as I'm sitting there at the table with them? To place myself in that scene. There's this this reconquering of our imaginations. Because what that opens us up to is the appreciation of beauty. One of the great tragedies in this world today is that beauty has been reduced to a commodity. It's been reduced to body parts. It's been re- reduced to being airbrushed and how much money can you make off this person's face or other part of their body to be able to appreciate beauty. So also, so that's the redemption of the imagination. Also to humanize what has been dehumanized. So to think about this too. If someone, say something comes up where, you know, there's, there's a, you're driving, you can't escape it, there's a billboard for suntan lotion or whatever it is, and it's, the woman's there in all of her glory, right? And you're driving by, and the kids see it, that it probably, maybe they're embarrassed about it, maybe they want to look at it, maybe they want to get a second glance when, you're, when they think you're not looking. But to be able to say, like, guys, did you see that, 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 uh, that billboard there? That lady has a name. And it's, just, and it's sad that we're, we just make her about her body. So if, if we were to talk to her and tell her about how much God loves her, what would we say to her? There's something profoundly diffusing about humanizing what gets objectified. And I think this is important for us, too, because we can just sort of lash out in like an anger or a hatred to the, towards those people that tempt our kids, right? I can't believe they would do this and they put this out there and this, I can't believe they're dressed like that. I can't believe they said this or they, you know, like in a sense we can kind of play deeper into the dehumanization and the, and the shaming of that reality. Not to say like, that's good, that's free expression, kids. No, that, it's not that. But to say, what if, we, what if we were to share the gospel with that person and if they knew how beautiful and how important their body was, how holy it is? Again, a good question to ask, a good, a good, a good conversation to have. 
instead of just thinking, well, hopefully I don't notice. Hopefully they never see a sexually explicit advertisement until they're 47 years old. You know, you know it, it's probably not going to work out that way. So um, we're at 720 right now, which is a little bit, uh, I was supposed to be done a little bit ago. But we'll, I'll go over this quickly here, or at least reference it for you guys. Again, this is the handout for those that are online. Uh, that's, uh, the link is in the, uh, the description of the YouTube video. Theology of the Body for Parents, Part 3. So parents of young women, this actually comes from catholicmom.com. Um, it says, what are some of those temptations that they encounter as young women that oppose the receptive and nurturing heart? So I got this from a Catholic mom, so it's not just coming from me. Of like, what do girls struggle with? Well, let me tell you what girls struggle with, because um, I'm not a girl. Praise God. Praise God. So a couple of things, and again, I'll just go through this, and maybe just, um, we won't have time to, to, to unpack every single one, though I would love to. Emphasis on the exterior rather than the interior. Again, these are some of the temptations that are faced for young women. Vanity, overwhelming fear, fear of how others think of you, judging others, extreme dieting or physical alterations, jealousy or envy, comparing yourself to others, feeling ill will towards others who succeed, immodesty, reveals what is meant to be reserved in the hopes of getting attention, desire for status among friends to be the hot one, gossip and manipulation, putting ourselves first, trying to control situations or other people, emotional lust, mental stalking, seeing others for what they can do for us rather than for who they are, allowing the imagination to run away, reading chiclet, I don't know what that is, with excessive sexuality. It's one, one sin that I can say I have not done, chiclet. Um, and for those who are ready to have a discussion of this nature, inappropriate use of the gift of sexuality, making out, sexting, pornography and masturbation, excessive curiosity about sex, vulgar dancing, inappropriate touch. Not just to say, like, this is the list and don't do these things, but to say, like, what is the, a person who commits, who does this, what are they really looking for? What do they really want? They want to be loved, right? We talked about Kesha a couple, whatever it was, last week, the week before, wanting to dance naked in the club. She wants to be loved. She has an infinite desire for love to be found beautiful and attractive. And so to not settle for these, all of these sins are a settling for the counterfeit of the real thing for which we were made. And that's inscribed in our very bodies, too. So for parents of young men, this was, was a little, uh, didn't have as much thought. This, this comes from me here, so if any of these don't make sense or I missed something, I apologize. What are these, some of these temptations that they encounter as young men that oppose their generative and courageous hearts? So I was trying to find a good corollary to the way the CatholicMom.com said of their receptive and nurturing hearts for girls, not that girls are, are merely receptive and, gener and receptive and nurturing, but there's something intrinsic to their femininity, intrinsic, intrinsic to their very bodies that is inherently receptive and nurturing. How do we know that's true? Because women can carry a, a human person, grow a human person in their bodies, or have the capacity to do so at least. That's amazing. That's something to rejoice about. That's not a sign of weakness. It's one of the most strong and powerful and world-shaking things. God saved the world through that. Through a woman carrying God in the flesh, in her body. There's something so powerful about that. And, it's, and the same thing, too, for men, this generative capacity to generate, to give life, to pour themselves out, even in the sexual act. Again, it's been so twisted in our mind to pour themselves out in love to empty themselves, Jesus empties himself for us so that we might have life. And that's described in the very bodies of young men, or of every man. Their generative and courageous hearts. So emphasis on competition. Again, competition is a good thing, but it's, if it's competition towards self-glory, it can be destructive. I'll, we should be competitive in, in, in grace, competitive in self-sacrificial love, competitive in I, I want to help the most people. I want to build the most people up. We think about that too. The competitors that do that are the ones ultimately that we respect the most. The silence of Adam. Think about that scene where Eve is being tempted by the, 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 dra by the dragon, by the serpent. <laughs> and Adam stands by silent. Comes across not as stepping up to defend the woman, her dignity, her worth, her goodness. And also the settling into watching rather than the risk of doing. That's something young men struggle with, particular, again, young women too, young men in particular, in our age really gives into that, where instead of doing, which is risky, I might fail, I might be rejected, I just watch somebody else do it. 
in a, in a benign sense that comes across in sports, in a sinful sense too, definitely in pornography. So many young men fall into a trap of pornography because there's no risk involved. I don't have to have a difficult conversation. I don't have to ask somebody on a date so I can just go to this thing that just sort of brings me pleasure or I can feel, feel powerful or validated or that I'm strong or I'm virile without having to have that risk of conversation and that I might be rejected. So disassociation is rampant in our society. Think about this too. Disassociation is where you've had a long day, you've been working all day, and you come home and you sit down and you turn on the office and you watch four episodes in a row, right? I'm not saying I've done that recently. Maybe it was two episodes. But in a sense, that, that in and of itself is not a sinful action in and of itself. However, we cultivate that, and that becomes a very important first stone, stepping stone, maybe it's just after frustration or anxiety or stress, towards sexual sins, where I live in a world of disassociation. So how do we, how do we combat that? Because again, everyone who's here has kids, they like to play video games, they like to do things that we have whole industries, multi-billion dollar industries that are built on disassociation. Can we begin to say, okay, guys, yesterday I had a tough day, you guys know that, and I watched three episodes of my show that I love. You're, me and your mom watched this show, and I really, that was not what I was looking for. So here's what I'm going to start doing. So again, not just saying, kids, stop watching the game, your video games, stop doing this, stop doing that, you're bad, you're this. You gotta, you're always on your device to recognize the struggle in ourselves. And here's something I'm going to start doing. Here's something life-giving that I'm going to start, start to... You know what I'm, we're going to start doing? I'm going to start... You, me and your mom are going to start going for a walk in the evenings. We're, we're going to do something life-giving. We're going to do something that takes us outside of ourselves. You know what we're going to do? I'm going to get home, and our neighbor, she doesn't have any kids in town. It would be great. We're just going to pop by and just say hello and have, have, have tea on the porch with her. To, in a sense, not just stop doing that thing. Again, it's the constant fight. God bless you parents who are fighting with screens and fighting with screen time and everything else. God bless you. It's a very difficult struggle that we're all in. But to say, can we put something, not just get rid of the bad, but we could, can we put something good in its place? So this continues with, um, obviously, masturbation and the objectification of self, self-soothing um, uh, uh, within a, a pornography addiction. The pornography leads towards addiction. The lack of authentic friendships is one of those things that leads to uh, easy areas of temptation. Shame around sexual experiences. If we don't have, so, it, it, for so many of us, too, in the father wounds and mother wounds, we don't have someone explaining to us what is going on in our lives with love and care and support, <laughs> not shaming us, but, re but recognizing that we're good and we're made for good. If we've fallen or sinned or been sinned against, and that doesn't have to define us, that there's hope there. Because of that, we find, we find our explanation in something else, in someone else. Usually now we have the internet, so a lot of times the internet can be the thing that, that people... Um, find that. So if you have a sexual experience, young people now will, will Google it. Praise God that was not a thing when I was a kid, but that's, you know, imagine that. I'm going through this. I'm feeling this. Type it in. The answers are all there. So we have these, uh, why are we have, talking about early and often with these conversations? Because if not, something else will rush to fill that void, and it's usually not something that's going to be life-giving. It's definitely not, usually, usually not the grace and light of the gospel. So this internalized anger as well, how do we deal with anger, with, with, particularly with young men? Fear and suspicion of masculine strength. There's something good about boys being strong. There's something good about that, inherently good. And we kind of don't really know how to deal with that as a society. And so society is ordered towards things that boys, you know, particularly young boys, are not necessarily good at. Silence and stillness and sitting quiet and don't move outside your 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 good behavior square, right? You know, like all those things that, that, that aren't, aren't necessarily uh, our gift. So we think, too, about uh, the, just the rise of violence towards women. Um, and I think, too, it's important for us to talk about that with boys, too, to talk about, like, why it is in the fall and sin that some men objectify or use or actually do violence against women, too. To be able to talk about that. How, first of all, that it's wrong, obviously, but, two, that there's, there's something, um, how we're called not just to not do that, but to, to 
live in a relationship of love and esteem for, uh, for every person, particularly those of the opposite sex. So I recommend that book, uh, Unwanted, by Jay Stringer as well. So, last thing here. I'm so sorry. We're, we're going way past time. Where sexual sin has been experienced. Just a couple of points here. So, kid says, I, I was at my friend's house, and he showed me his phone and had people kissing and doing other things, and I think it's called, he told me it was sex. And so, all of a sudden, there, a, a trauma has happened there. Again, not to be overly dramatic with that, but a trauma has happened. So what do we do with that? Or, you know, you know there, there's um, more sustained or chosen or willfully chosen sexual sins that they're participating in any age, acknowledging the fundamental goodness of their sexual desires in their bodies. And I can say this from the perspective of me as a priest, when someone brings confe- you know, uh, sexual sins into confession, the first and foremost the thing we always come back to is that they're loved by God. Loved by God. That, 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 that's first and foremost. The goodness of who they are, the goodness of their bodies, the fundamental goodness even of their sexual desires, even if it's been misused or mis, misdirected. Unpacking where this action has missed the mark and what it would look like if they were to behave virtuously in that moment. What would it look like if instead of you doing this, you behave virtuously or how God is inviting you to live? What, what would that look like? What would be some examples of that? Maybe that comes up in a television show where people behave in a certain way or the sex scene pops up out of nowhere and you don't know how to work the control and then all of a sudden it happened, it's there and you just, don't want, you're just, you just want to sink into the floor. But say like, all right, for those, for, for, those, for those people in that show, what would it look like if they loved each other well there? They loved how God is calling us to love. Again, it's an uncomfortable conversation. But the, the, the thing has already happened. All the follow-up is now up to you. To say, am I going to address this? Am I going to have a conversation here? Even if it's not perfect, then it begins all of a sudden to be not just, oh, this is awful, don't, you know, don't think about it. Because there is attraction to that. When you see an attractive body, you're attracted to it. And that's actually good. But how can we continue to recognize how it can be reshaped? And then specifically praying for persons involved in sexual scenes or even pornography that is witnessed. Again, can we, pray and, can we pray over that where I saw this stuff and be like, I'm so sorry that you, saw that, that, that you saw that scene or that you witnessed that or that, you know, I'm sorry, you, you know, you're not bad, you're good, but what we witness is, is, is destructive and is hurtful to those people. So we're going to say a prayer for them and so that they know that their bodies are worth more, that they, they uh, reserve sexual activity for only their spouse and not in a way that's, that's being filmed and been, being put out there for other people to see. So again, so being able to humanize what has been dehumanized. And then praying also for redeeming memories. I, I love this as well. This is a really good thing for us to, to, to spend some time in too, where someone has a painful memory that, that, that came up and say like, can we experience God loving us there in that memory? In that moment, the love of God for us there. Can God, can we experience God saying, again, where, where, where we have to rebuke the lie of the enemy, rebuke the lie of lust and, and use, and, and said to hear the voice of the Father speaking over us. So helping your kids, kind of that Lexio Divina, that Lexio even of, over their own memories, I think, I think is really important as well. That's really what confession is too. Confession is me bringing up the worst parts of my life so that I can experience the Father's blessing over those parts. So again, confession is not just like, give me those sins, give me that list. It's excavating through the power of the Holy Spirit those places of shame and condemnation so that I can experience that the Lord forgives me and that even there he loves me. Being able to help our kids cultivate that sort of, of mentality, particularly when, you, when something comes to your attention that you know that this happened, that you know that this happened and say, okay, we, we need to talk about this. We're going to talk about what happened. What could you do differently next time? How can, you know, you know, to recognize why this is wrong, but also to ultimately to experience the Father's blessing over us there. So it is now 734. I'm so sorry. You are I'm good. Long this conversation you are here. good. It, there's so much, and there's, yeah. it's all so good, and it's just so necessary. So I'm going to make some very brief closing announcements and then a very brief prayer to kind of wrap us up. Thank you, Father Michael. Um, the, the three questions that we want to get to, we won't get to those, to those tonight. We're going to save those for next week. So next week is going to be our last night of this series, but be on the lookout for some continued, maybe we're talking about maybe like a little monthly kind of refresher course for all of us. But those three questions that were on our list that several, we've gotten a few questions about, 
One about lust, and Father Michael talked a good bit about lust. I think, I think we, there's even more to say about it, obviously. Homosexuality and then transgenderism. And so we will um, talk about those. Again, no silver bullets on any of this, no easy fixes to any of it, but we're going to bring those up for discussion next week. And we have another, uh, another couple that I want to bring in that's going to um, share some with us. So that's coming. But I did want to say... This book, God's Plan for You, it's on the resource list that we put out. Um, I, I, I really like it. It's, it's written for teenagers, and so it's very understandable, but it's really good about having short little sections on particular issues. So it's like somebody asked about polygamy. There's a little section on polygamy. Somebody asked about homosexuality. There's a little section on that. You know, so like there's, there's a section for each. So I, I do want to recommend that if like you have a burning question that we haven't been able to get to, maybe check out that book. Um, also, another, uh, no, I'll plug that later. Okay, the, the last little plug is that this is providential because God is so good. You know, we may be hearing all this stuff about that, um, that our, our love, our, our, uh, that love is supposed to model the love of the Trinity. And um, when we think about that, we're, we've kind of been applying this to certain distortions, but it's true in our marriages too. And I know that sometimes, at least this has been my own reaction as I've learned about theology of the body and just how beautiful and how like the, the self gift that we're supposed to be to each other. And then I look at the 15 and a half years that Vince and I have been married and I'm like, ooh, we, like ours didn't always look like that. You know, like ours, ours doesn't always feel like that. It doesn't always look like that. And so um, obviously, like, we're practicing the virtues, we're practicing the faith, we're not perfect in it, but as luck would have it, there is another um, thing coming up, it's called Adventures in Marriage, we, these have been offered in our area before, and so I just propose that as something for you, God bless you, um, something for you to think about beyond that, I, I strategically placed the posters out there so that you had to see them coming in and going, and so if this has kind of, like, brought up anything, stirred up anything in your own heart where you were like, oh gosh, my, my marriage needs a tune-up, you know, like, and the, the Adventures in Marriage classes are not specifically about theology of the body, but they're certainly in support of a healthy marriage and healthy communication, which absolutely ties in with the theology of the body, so I just wanted to give a quick plug on that, and then uh, we'll come back together next week, we'll, we'll probably won't have Father Michael with us in person, I think we're going to do a video teaching maybe, but we'll, we'll tweak that between now and then, and then that'll be our wrap-up of the series, but, um, yeah, obviously we just can't exhaust this. We're going to keep swimming in it. And so with that, let and me... October 15th and 16th is the is Adventures, Adventures in Marriage. marriage. October 15th, the, the next yeah. one. There'll be another one after that, too. Okay, and all the dates are on those posters out there. So if, you, if you're if you interested, just snap a picture with your phone and then go home and, like, talk to spouses and look at your calendar, okay? Um, all right, close with a prayer. This, was, this prayer was all my heart. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Okay, Lord, we just bring all of this to you. And I want to specifically pray for any of us who might be feeling um, any feelings of condemnation right now. So whether it's like hearing something that Father Michael said where we ourselves have fallen short, where we ourselves have missed the mark, where we ourselves have misused the gift of our own sexuality. Or maybe it was something in what Margaret said where we hear this, this beautiful ideal of parenthood and in gratitude for Margaret and Ryan's humility but sometimes, there, sometimes that voice of the enemy can creep in and accuse us of where we are failing or where we have failed. We bring that to you right now, Jesus, and we reject that. We reject any lies of the enemy who wants nothing more than to condemn us in those areas, to make us feel hopeless, to uh, somehow delay or, or stop our uh, redemption wants to block that redemption. We reject that right now, Jesus, and we give it all to you. We give you our past, we give you our futures, our failures and our successes, and we give you our sexuality, our very maleness and femaleness, and we pray for hope and redemption in our very bodies. And I want to pray with the good old Catholic prayer, the glory be, because as I have prayed that prayer, you know, there's a line in that prayer when we say, as it was in the beginning, and I am hearing that prayer in a new way this week as we've been swimming in all this theology of the body. And so I want to invite you to just picture in your imagination, in your mind's eye, as it was in the beginning. And so we pray together. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen.
In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Guys, thank y'all so much. I did forget this. On your way out, you can, you can like get up and walk out as I'm talking because I just want you to know this. Um, thanks to Kathy Vaden who brought these. These were some extra resources we had from a TOB, TOB course we did with the teens last semester. There's just a handful. There's a handful of these books. It's like first come, first serve. They're the parent guide to a, a teenage version of TOB on that desk out there. And then these are called compact discs. You may not have seen one of these in a while. This is a CD, but it's a talk, a good talk on how to form pure teens. There's two of those out there too. So just some freebies out there on our sample table if you want to grab those. God bless y'all. We'll hope to see you next week.